Часть вторая. Lesson one. John Reed's biography by Albert Rees Williams. For many people all over the world, and particularly for those in English-speaking countries, Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed was the first introduction to the great October Socialist Revolution. The book was one of the first to tell the people in the West the truth about the Russian Revolution. Born in Portland, Oregon on October 22, 1887, John Reed took after his father who was a fighter by nature. After leaving school, John Reed went to Harvard, America's most famous university. Having taken his degree, John Reed entered the wide world outside the walls of the university. Soon he was in great demand as a writer of articles, stories, poems and plays, which were published in the leading journals and magazines. As a journalist, he travelled widely all over the United States, and the experience he gained during these trips brought him closer to the workers. He got to know their life very well and took an active part in their struggle. In the town of Patterson, a strike of textile workers turned into a revolutionary storm, and John Reed was among the strikers. In the state of Colorado, an agricultural area of the United States, he joined the Negroes who rose against racial discrimination. When World War I broke out, John Reed travelled to the battlefronts in France, Germany, Turkey and Italy, and in Russia too. And everywhere he went, he continued fighting for justice in spite of the danger to himself. From the battlefields of Europe, he returned to the United States, not with fine words about the cruelty at the front, but exposing the war as a whole, a war unleashed by the imperialists to increase their profits at the expense of the people. For the anti-war information that he spread, he was brought before a New York court. Lesson 2 Mistaken Identity by Mark Twain Years ago, I arrived one day at Salamanca, New York, where I was to change trains and take the sleeper. There were crowds of people on the platform, and they were all trying to get into the long sleeper train which was already packed. I asked the young man in the booking office if I could have a sleeping berth, and he answered, No. I went off and asked another local official if I could have some poor little corner somewhere in a sleeping car. But he interrupted me angrily, saying, No, you can't. Every corner is full. Now don't bother me any more. And he turned his back and walked off. I felt so hurt that I said to my companion, If these people knew who I was, they... But my companion stopped me there. Don't talk such nonsense. We'll have to put up with this, he said. If they knew who you were, do you think it would help to get you a vacant seat in a train which has no vacant seats in it? This did not improve my condition at all. But just then, I noticed the porter of a sleeping car had his eye on me. I saw the expression of his face suddenly change. He whispered to the uniformed conductor pointing to me, and I realised I was being talked about. Then the conductor came forward, his face all politeness. Can I be of any service to you? he asked. Do you want a place in a sleeping car? Yes, I said. I'll be grateful to you if you can give me a place. Anything will do. We have nothing left except the big family compartment, he continued, with two berths and a couple of armchairs in it. But it is entirely at your disposal. Here, Tom, take these suitcases aboard. Then he touched his hat and we moved along. I was eager to say a few words to my companion, but I changed my mind. The porter made us comfortable in the compartment, and then said with many bows and smiles, Now, is there anything you want, sir? Because you can have just anything you want. Can I have some hot water, please? I asked. Yes, sir, I'll get it myself. Good. Now that lamp is hung too high above the berth. Can I have a better lamp fixed? just at the head of my bed, below the luggage rack, so that I can read comfortably. Lesson 4 The Creative Impulse by W. S. Morn When Mrs. Forrester's first detective story, The Achilles Statue, was published, she had reached the respectable age of 57, 
and the number of her works was considerable. Her great talent, however, remained undiscovered by ordinary readers, and this was the reason her books did not sell, though they were highly praised by the critics. Mrs. Forrester was deeply interested in politics, and even thought of going into Parliament. Her only difficulty was that she did not know which party to choose. A lot of people very much wanted to be invited to the parties she gave every Saturday, but only a few were among her guests. The only person who spoiled these parties was Mr. Albert Forrester, her husband. All her friends considered him a bore and often asked one another why she had ever married him. He was known among them as the philatelist because a young writer had once said that he was collecting stamps. Albert, I should explain, was an ordinary businessman and not a very rich one. The suits he wore always looked shabby. The expression on his face was gloomy and he never said anything worth listening to. Mrs. Forrester, however, was kind to him and always knew how to put to shame anyone who tried to make fun of him in her presence. Lesson 5. The Creative Impulse by W.S. Morn continued. Good afternoon, Bullfinch, said Mrs. Forrester. I wish to see your master. Mrs. Bullfinch hesitated for a second, then held the door wide open. Come in, ma'am. She turned her head. Albert, here's Mrs. Forrester to see you. Mrs. Forrester went in quickly, and there was Albert sitting by the fire, leaning back on an old armchair and reading the evening paper. How are you, my dear? said Albert cheerfully, putting aside the paper. Keeping well, I hope. Won't you sit down, ma'am? said Mrs. Bullfinch, pushing the chair forward. Could I see you alone, Albert? Mrs. Forrester asked, sitting down. I'm afraid not, Albert answered. Because of Mrs. Bullfinch, I think she should be present. As you wish. Well, my dear, what have you to say to me? Albert asked. Mrs. Forrester gave him her best smile. I don't blame you for anything, Albert. I know it isn't your fault, and I'm not angry with you. But a joke's a joke, and should not be carried too far. I've come to take you home. Then I think you're wasting your time, my dear, said Albert. Nothing will ever make me live with you again. Have you not been happy with me, Albert? asked Mrs. Forrester in a deeper tone, trying not to show her feelings were hurt. We've been married for 35 years, my dear. It's a long time, isn't it? You're a good woman in your own way, but not suitable for me. You're literary and I'm not. You're artistic and I'm not. But all this time I've been doing everything in my power to interest you in art and literature, said Mrs. Forrester. That's true. I can only blame myself if I didn't react properly. But I don't like the books you write. And I don't like the people who surround you. Let me tell you a secret, my dear. At your parties, I often very much wanted to take off my clothes, just to see what would happen. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Albert? asked Mrs. Bullfinch. You haven't got the right figure for that at all. Mrs. Bullfinch wants me to retire, Albert continued. I discussed the matter with my partners today, and they agree to settle everything nicely. They will buy me out, and I shall have an income of just under £900. There are three of us, so it gives us nearly 300 a year each. How am I to live on that? cried Mrs. Forrester, using the last argument she could think of. You have a wonderful pen, my dear. You know very well that the books don't bring me any money. The publishers only say that they lose by them. And just then, Mrs. Bullfinch suddenly asked, Why don't you write a good detective story? Mrs. Forrester burst out laughing. Me! she exclaimed. What a wild idea! I could never hope to please the masses, and I have never read a detective story in all my life. It's not a bad idea at all, said Albert. I love a detective story, 
said Mrs. Bullfinch. Give me a lady in an evening dress lying dead on the library floor, and I know I'm going to enjoy it. Personally, I prefer a respectable gentleman with a gold watch chain lying dead in Hyde Park, said Albert. There's something particularly interesting to the reader in the murder of a respectable gentleman. I see what you mean, said Mrs. Bullfinch. He knew an important secret, and his murderers said they would kill him unless he kept his mouth shut. He just didn't manage to run away from them. We can give you all the advice you need, my dear, said Albert, smiling kindly at Mrs. Forrester. I've read hundreds of detective stories. Lesson seven. He overdid it. From the story The Rathskeller and the Rose by O. Henry. Miss Posy Carrington had begun life in the small village of Cranberry Corners. Then her name had been Posy Boggs. At the age of 18, she had left the place and become an actress at a small theatre in a large city. And here she took the name of Carrington. Now Miss Carrington was at the height of her fame. The critics praised her, and in the next season she was going to star in a new play about country life. Many young actors were eager to partner Miss Posy Carrington in the play, and among them was a clever young actor called Highsmith. My boy, said Mr Goldstein, the manager of the theatre, when the young man went to him for advice. Take the part if you can get it. The trouble is, Miss Carrington won't listen to any of my suggestions. As a matter of fact, she has turned down a lot of the best imitators of a country fellow already, and she always says she won't set foot on the stage unless her partner is the best that can be found. She was brought up in a village, you know. She won't be deceived when a Broadway fellow goes on the stage with a straw in his hair and calls himself a village boy. So, young man, if you want to play the part, you'll have to convince Miss Carrington. Would you like to try? I would with your permission, answered the young man. But I would prefer to keep my plans secret for a while. Next day, Highsmith took the train for Cranberry Corners. He stayed three days in that small and distant village. Having found out all he could about the bogs and their neighbours, Highsmith returned to the city. Lesson 8. A Future Businessman. From The Financier by Theodore Drowser. Buttonwood Street, Philadelphia, where Frank Copperwood spent the first ten years of his life, was a lovely place for a boy to live in. There were mainly red brick houses there, with small marble steps leading up to the front doors. There were trees in the street, a lot of them. Behind each house there was a garden with trees and grass, and sometimes flowers. The Copperwoods, father and mother, were happy with their children. Henry Copperwood, the father of the family, started life as a bank clerk, but when Frank, his elder son, was ten, Henry Copperwood became a teller at the bank. As his position grew more responsible, his business connections increased. He already knew a number of rich businessmen who dealt with the bank where he worked. The brokers knew him as representing a well-known firm and considered him to be a most reliable person. Lesson 9. Dialogues to be learnt by heart. At the office. Let's have a look at the diary. What are the engagements for today? Mr. Petrov has an appointment for ten. And then there's a conference at three. Get the documents ready for the conference. I'm afraid these bills will keep me busy till twelve. Shall I arrange for Mr. Petrov to come later? Yes, you'd better. Phone him straight away, and then attend to the documents. Very good. Could I speak to Mr. Petrov, please? He's on another line at the moment. Would you hold on? I'm afraid I can't. I'll leave a message for him. Will you please ask him to call at Mr. White's office at 12 tomorrow instead of 10? All right. I'll let him know. Lesson 10. The Serenade by G. Bernard Shaw. I celebrated my 40th birthday by putting on one of the amateur theatrical performances for which my house at Beckenham is famous. 
The play, written by myself, was in three acts. An important feature was the sound of a horn in the second act. I had engaged a horn player to blow the horn. He was to place himself not on the stage, but downstairs in the hall, so as to make it sound distant. The best seat was occupied by the beautiful Linda Fitz Nightingale. The next chair, which I had intended for myself, had been taken by Mr. Pacharister, a young man of some musical talent. As Linda loved music, Pacharister's talent gave him, in her eyes, an advantage over older and cleverer men. I decided to break up their conversation as soon as I could. After I had seen that everything was all right for the performance, I hurried to Linda's side with an apology for my long absence. As I approached, Pachalister rose, saying, I'm going behind the stage if you don't mind. Boys will be boys, I said when he had gone. But how are your musical studies progressing? I'm full of Schubert now. Oh, Colonel Green, do you know Schubert's serenade? Oh, a lovely thing. It's something like this, I think. Yes. It's a little like that. Does Mr. Pachalister sing it? I hated to hear her mention the name, so I said, he tries to sing it. But do you like it? She asked. Hmm, well, the fact is, I tried to avoid a straight answer. Do you like it? Oh, I love it. I dream of it. I've lived on it for the last three days. I hope to hear you sing it when the play's over. I sing it? Oh, I'd never dare. Ah, oh, here is Mr. Macharlister. I'll make him promise to sing it to us. Green, said Macharlister. I don't wish to bother you, but the man who is to play the horn hasn't turned up. Dear me, I said. I ordered him at exactly half past seven. If he fails to come in time, the play will be spoiled. I excused myself to Linda and hurried to the hall. The horn was there on the table, but the man was nowhere to be seen. Lesson 11. The Serenade by G. Bernard Shaw. Continued. I did succeed at last. I hate to discourage you, but if I were you, Colonel, my teacher said, as he put the five pounds into his pocket. I'd keep the tune to myself and play something simpler to my friends. I didn't take this advice, though I now see that he was right. But at that time, I intended to serenade Linda. Her house was situated at the northern end of Park Lane, and I had already bribed a servant to let me into the small garden between the house and the street. Late in June, I at last learned that she intended to stay at home for an evening. I'll make an attempt, I thought, and at nine o'clock I took up my horn and drove to Marble Arch, where I got out and walked to her house. I was stopped by the voice of poor Charleston, calling, Hello, Colonel. The meeting was most inconvenient. I did not want him to ask me where I was going, so I thought it best to ask him first. I'm going to see Linda, he answered. She told me last night that she would be all alone this evening. You know how good she is. I love her. If I could be sure that it is myself and not my voice that she likes, I should be the happiest man in England. I'm quite sure it can't be your voice, I said. Thank you, he said. It's very kind of you to say so. Do you know I've never had the courage to sing that serenade since she told me she loved me? Why? Doesn't she like the way you sing it? I never dare sing it before her, but I'm going to surprise her with it tomorrow at Mrs. Loxley's Hall. If you meet her, don't say a word of this. It's going to be a surprise. I have no doubt it will be, I said, happy to know that he would be a day too late. We parted and I saw him enter Linda's house. A few minutes later, I was in the garden, looking up at them from my place in the shadow of a big tree as they sat near the open window. 
I thought he would never go. I almost decided to go home. Had I not heard her playing the piano, I should never have held out. At eleven o'clock they rose, and I was now able to hear what they were saying. Yes, she said, it's time for you to go. But you might have sung the serenade for me. I've played it three times for you. I have a cold, he said. Don't be angry with me. You'll hear me sing it sooner than you think, perhaps. Sooner than I think. If you want to give me a surprise, I'll forgive you. I'll see you at Mrs. Loxley's halls tomorrow, I hope. He said yes, and hurried away. When he was gone, she came to the window and looked out at the stars. I took out the horn. I began. At the first note, I saw her start and listen. She recognized the serenade. The instrument was like ice, and my lips were stiff. But in spite of all that, I succeeded fairly well. When I had finished, I looked up at the window. She was writing now. A minute later, the door of the house opened, and the servant whom I had bribed came towards me with a letter in his hand. My heart beat as I saw it. Are you there, sir? I heard him say as I came out of the shadow. Miss Linda told me to give you this. He held out the letter. But you are not to open it, if you please, until you get home. Then she knew who I was, I said. I think so, sir. Lesson 12. Dialogues to be learned by heart. Talk about the weather. Nick. What lovely weather we had last week. I hope it keeps dry and sunny this week too. Mary. Well, I wouldn't be sure. Have you heard the forecast? Nick. No. What does it say? Mary. Occasional showers tomorrow morning, drizzle and more cloud later on, unsettled for the rest of the week. Nick. Oh, isn't that awful? I do hope it clears up by Saturday. Mary. Why are you so eager? Nick. Don't you remember? We were planning an outing for this weekend. Mary. Oh, yes. Shall I ask Anne? She's a great one for outings. Nick. Of course. Phone her straight away, will you? Mary. All right. Lesson 13. At the restaurant. From A Thing of Beauty. By... A. J. Cronin. Stephen Desmond had returned home after several years at Oxford, where he had been taking a course of theology. Stephen himself did not want to be a parson, and had only taken up the course because his father wished him to do so. He was fond of painting, and wanted to devote his life to art. Against his father's will, he left England to study painting in France. On arriving in Paris, he entered Professor Dupre's art school. The extract given below is an account of his meeting with the other students from England. At one o'clock, a bell rang. Immediately, a cry went up from everywhere, and all around, the students began crowding towards the door, pushing Stephen forward against his will. Suddenly, he heard a pleasant voice behind him. You're English, aren't you? I noticed you come in. My name's Harry Chester. Stephen turned his head and discovered a good-looking young man of about his own age smiling down at him. I'll wait for you downstairs, Chester called out as the crowd carried him away. Outside, Chester offered his hand. I hope you don't mind my speaking to you. Stephen who felt lonely in Paris, was glad to find a friend. When Stephen had introduced himself, Chester paused for a moment, then exclaimed, How about lunching with me? They started off together along the street. 
The restaurant they went to was quite near, a narrow, low-ceilinged room opening into a dark little kitchen. Already the place was crowded, mainly by students, but Chester led the way through to a little yard and calmly removing the scarred mark reserved from a table at the far end, invited Stephen to be seated. Immediately, a stout, red-faced woman in black ran out of the kitchen in protest. No, no, Harry. This place is reserved for Monsieur Lambert. Do not get excited, Madame Chaubert. Max Chester smiled. You know Monsieur Lambert is my good friend. Besides, he is always late. Madame Chaubert was not pleased. She tried to argue, but in the end, Harry Chester's pleasant manner was too much for her. She stopped arguing and offered the menu card for their inspection. At Chester's suggestion, they ordered tomato soup, steak, and cheese. Beer was already on the table. Strange, isn't it, Chester said, how you can always tell a university man. Phil Lambert is one, too. After Harrow, he shot a quick glance at Stephen. I should have gone to Cambridge myself if I hadn't given it up for art. He went on to say, with a smile, that his father had been a well-known tea planter in Ceylon. His mother, now a widow, lived in England and was quite rich. Naturally, she spoiled him by giving him too much money. He'd been in Paris 18 months. It's a lot of fun, he said finally. Lesson 14. Dialogues to be learned by heart. In the street. A. Let's drop in somewhere for a snack. B. I'd rather have a proper meal. It's lunchtime now. A. All right. Shall we go to a restaurant? B. Yes, let's. There's quite a nice one over there on the left-hand side. They have a self-service department there too, though I don't want to go there today. At the restaurant. A. There's a nice table for two. Shall we take it? B. Can't you see it's reserved? A. Oh, I see. Come over here, then. We'll be very comfortable at this table. B. Seated. Will you have any hors d'oeuvres? A. Not today. I'll start with the soup and have a steak to follow. B. I had meat for my main course yesterday, so I'll have fish for a change. A. Shall we order the sweet straight away? What would you like? B. Fruit salad and ice cream for me. A. All right. I'll have the same. Lesson 15. On the way to freedom. From... Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. One rainy afternoon, a traveller stopped at the door of a small country hotel in a village in Kentucky. The newcomer was a short, stout man, carefully dressed, with a round, good-natured face. What's that? he asked, noticing that some of the guests had formed a group around a large advertisement. Nigger advertised, said one of the group. Mr. Wilson, for that was the gentleman's name, took out his glasses and fixed them on his nose. Then he read, Ran away my mulatto boy, George. Said George, six feet in height, a very light mulatto, brown curly hair, is very intelligent, speaks handsomely, and can read and write, has been branded on his right hand with the letter H. I will give $400 for him alive and the same sum for a liable proof that he has been killed. The old gentleman read this advertisement from end to end in a low voice. Then he said aloud, the boy described here is a fine fellow. He worked for me six years or so at my factory. 
and he was my best hand. He invented a good machine, a really valuable one. His master holds the patent of it. To be sure, said another man in the group, he holds it and makes money out of it, and at the same time he brands the boy on his right hand. If I have a chance, I'll mark him so that he'll carry it for a long time. The conversation was interrupted by the arrival of a well-dressed gentleman with a coloured servant. The newcomer was very tall, with a dark Spanish complexion, fine expressive black eyes, and curly hair, also black. He walked up to the bar and gave his name as Henry Butler, Oakland's, Shelby County. Turning with an indifferent air to the advertisement, he read it through. Mr. Wilson looked at the newcomer. It seemed to him he had met the man somewhere, and then he remembered. He stared at the stranger with such an air of surprise that the latter walked up to him. Mr. Wilson, I think, he said in a quiet voice. I beg your pardon, I hardly recognized you. I see you remember me. Mr. Butler of Oakland's, Shelby County. Yeah, yes, yes, sir, said Mr. Wilson, like one speaking in a dream. I should like to have a few moments' conversation with you on business, in private, in my room, if you please, added the newcomer. When they entered the room upstairs, the young man locked the door, put the key in his pocket, and looked Mr. Wilson straight in the face. George! said Mr. Wilson. Yes, George, said the young man. I'm fairly well disguised, it seems. I've dyed my hair black, so you see, I don't answer to the advertisement at all. For a few minutes, Mr. Wilson could not say a word. When he began to speak at last, his voice was trembling. Well, George, I see you're running away, leaving your lawful master, George. I think it's my duty to tell you. I am sorry to see you in opposition to the laws of your country. My country, said George with bitterness. I have no country. You see, George, said Mr. Wilson, well, I think you're running an awful risk. You should be very careful. They'll kill you if they catch you. Lesson 16, A Custom House Incident, by Nigel Balchin. Among the passengers travelling home by train from Florence, there was a certain Miss Bradley. I only noticed her when passing down the corridor, because of her really remarkable plainness. She was rather a large, awkward woman of about 35, with a big red nose and large spectacles. Later on, when I went to the dining car, Miss Bradley was already seated, and the attendant placed me opposite her. I think we may have exchanged half a dozen words at dinner when passing one another the sugar or the bread, but they were certainly all we exchanged. And after we left the dining car, I did not see Miss Bradley again until we reached Calais Maritime. And then our acquaintance really began, and it began entirely on my own initiative. There were plenty of porters, and I called one without difficulty from the window of the train. But as I got off, I saw Miss Bradley standing on the platform with two very large old suitcases. The porters were passing her by. I am quite sure that had she been an even slightly attractive woman, I should not have gone up to her. But she was so ugly and looked so helpless that I approached her and said, my porter has a barrow. Would you like him to put your cases on it too? Miss Bradley turned and looked at me. Oh, thank you. It's very kind of you. My porter, without much enthusiasm, added her luggage to mine, and in a few minutes we found ourselves on board the Channel Ferry. Before the boat had been underway for ten minutes, I realized 
that Miss Bradley was a remarkable bore. Shyly and hesitantly, she kept on talking about nothing and made no remark worth taking notice of. I learned that she had been in Italy a fortnight, visiting her sister, who was married to an Italian. She had never been out of England before. I did not look forward to travelling to London with her for another four hours, so, excusing myself, I went along to the booking office on board the boat and booked myself a seat on the Golden Arrow. Miss Bradley was travelling by the ordinary boat train, so this would mean we should part at Dover. At Dover, I hired one of the crew to carry our luggage. Normally, passengers for the Golden Arrow are dealt with by the customs first as the train leaves 20 minutes before the ordinary boat train. When the boy asked if we were going on the Golden Arrow, I hesitated and then said, yes. It was too difficult to explain that one of us was and one of us wasn't, and then it would get Miss Bradley through the customs quickly. As we went towards the customs hall, I explained carefully to her that my train left before hers, but that I would see her through the customs. The boy would then take the luggage to our trains, and she could sit comfortably in hers till it left. Miss Bradley said, Oh, thank you very much. The boy, of course, had put our suitcases together on the counter, and Miss Bradley and I went and stood before them. In due course, the customs examiner reached us looked at the four suitcases in that human X-ray manner, which customs examiners must practice day and morning, and said, This is all yours. I was not quite sure whether he was speaking to me, or me and Miss Bradley. So I replied, Well, mine and this lady's. The examiner said, But you're together. For the moment, I said rather foolishly, smiling at Miss Bradley. Lesson 17. Dialogue. To be learned by heart. My friend goes abroad. A. Here we are at last. What time does your plane take off? B. 9.30. We've plenty of time yet. I'll go and have my luggage weighed now. A. How much are you allowed to take with you? B. I travel tourist class, so it's about 20 kilos. I don't think my luggage weighs more than that. A. Will it take you long to go through the customs? B. No, it'll be just a formality. I've nothing to declare. A. When are you due in London? B. It's a non-stop flight, so I'll be there long before lunch. A. Oh, that's wonderful. You won't even have time to get airsick. B. I never do, though I'm a poor sailor. A. Then you can look forward to a pleasant journey. Lesson 18. The Last Leaf by O. Henry. At the top of an old brick house in New York. Two young painters, Sue and Jonesy, had their studio. They had met in a cheap restaurant and soon discovered that though their characters differed, their views on life and art were the same. Some time later, they found a room that was suitable for a studio and began to live even more economically than before. That was in May. In November, a cold unseen stranger, whom the doctors called pneumonia, went from place to place in the district where they lived, touching people here and there with his icy fingers. Mr. Pneumonia was not what you would call a kind old gentleman. It was hardly fair of him to pick out a little woman like Jonesy, who was obviously unfit to stand the strain of the suffering. But he did and she lay on her narrow bed, with no strength to move, looking at the next brick house. After examining Jonesy one morning, 
the doctor called Sue out of the room and gave her a prescription, saying, I don't want to frighten you, but at present she has one chance in, let us say, ten. And that chance is for her to want to live. But your little lady has made up her mind that she isn't going to get well. And if a patient loses interest in life, it takes away 50% from the power of medicine. If you could somehow get her to ask one question about the new winter styles and hats, I would promise you a one in five chance for her. After the doctor had gone, Sue went out into the hall and cried. As soon as she could manage to check her tears, she walked gaily back into the room, whistling a merry tune. Jonesy lay with her eyes towards the window. Thinking that Jonesy was asleep, Sue stopped whistling. She arranged her drawing board and began working. Soon she heard a low sound, several times repeated. She went quickly to the bedside. Jonesy's eyes were wide open. She was looking out of the window and counting, counting backwards. Twelve, she said, and a little later, eleven, then ten, and nine, and then eight, and seven, almost together. Lesson nineteen, dialogue, to be learned by heart. Going to see a doctor. Hello, Peter. I haven't seen you around lately. Where have you been? Peter, I've been away with a bad cold for over a week. In fact, I'm still on sick leave, though I'm no longer running a temperature. Hey, are you? Well, you should stay in bed until you're completely cured then. Colds may have serious complications. B, I know they may, but as a matter of fact, I'm only going to the outpatients. And then perhaps I'll drop in at the chemist. A. Who's your doctor? B. Dr. Krasnov has been treating me. Do you know him? A. Yes. He's a very good man for heart trouble. Well, bye-bye. I wish you a quick recovery. B. Thank you. So long. Lesson 20. A cup of tea by Catherine Mansfield. Rosemary Fell was not exactly beautiful. She was young, brilliant, extremely modern, well-dressed and amazingly well-read in the newest of the new books. Rosemary had been married two years and her husband was very fond of her. They were rich, really rich, not just comfortably well off. So if Rosemary wanted to shop, she would go to Paris, as you and I would go to Bond Street. One winter afternoon, she went into a small shop to look at a little box, which the shopman had been keeping for her. He had shown it to nobody as yet, so that she might be the first to see it. Charming, Rosemary admired the box, but how much would he charge her for it? For a moment, the shopman did not seem to hear. The lady could certainly afford a high price. Then his words reached her. Twenty-eight guineas, madam. Twenty-eight guineas. Rosemary gave no sign, even if one is rich. Her voice was dreamy as she answered, Well, keep it for me, will you? I'll... The shopman bowed. He would be willing, of course, to keep it for her forever.